Hello everyone. Regular listeners to Atomic Hobo will know that I am currently writing a book about the same topic as this podcast, about our preparations for nuclear war, and that the book is due with my publisher in July. So I'm on the final stretch, of course, of uh, getting everything done, getting everything tidied up and ready for the editor. It's questionable, of course, whether it will ever be ready, and I don't know if the moment will arise when I finally think that's it done. I feel satisfied and happy and I will press send. Maybe uh, a more experienced writer could tell me, does that moment ever actually arise? But um, I am furiously busy with the book and I decided over the weekend to give myself June off from podcasting. But I felt guilty about that, especially when I woke up this morning to find uh, a new patron had signed up and that another one had generously increased their monthly donation, so I just felt uh, guilty, even though I'm sure you all understand why I would want to take the month off. So I thought what I would do as a kind of halfway, um, as a compromise, is read you an extract from the book. So I haven't done any original research for this week's podcast, of course. I'm just reading you the start of my chapter on the Civil Defence Corps. So I'll read you just uh, two pages of that. Um, I thought that was better than just doing nothing this week. But if I'm not as regular at delivering a podcast each Monday as I usually am, I hope you will understand why, and I hope you will stick with me. Please don't unsubscribe from the podcast. Please stick with it. And of course, all the people who support me on Patreon, you're also also supporting my nuclear research and the writing of my book. Some of you are going to be mentioned in the acknowledgements and receive free signed copies, etc. So please do stick with me is, is what I'm asking. I just might need to take most of June off to hunker down and get this thing done. So, enough yapping. Let me read you the opening from my chapter on the Civil Defence Corps. It starts, um, it doesn't start with, the Civil Defence Corps was founded in 1948, blah blah blah, because of course I'm not writing a school essay. I like to take detours um, in my writing. I do it sometimes in the podcast. Um, Last week's podcast about um, Britain's first atomic test, I think I went off in a tiny detour and talked a bit about Jack the Ripper. Uh, Nothing wrong with that. Some people might find it frustrating. You know, they're not here to read about or hear about Jack the Ripper. But um, I like those little tangents and detours. I like those little meanderings, as long as you're telling a story, of course, and a good story. So that's what I've done here with this civil defence chapter. It opens with a description of the Festival of Britain, Uh, The festival was in 1951 and it was um, a way of Britain cheering itself up after the long, horrible slog of war and all the austerity which came afterwards. But I'll shut up and I'll start reading you the first two pages of it. After the grey of the war years came strawberry pink and bright blue. In 1951, the Festival of Britain opened in London on land cleared of blitz debris. A national celebration of British industry, science and creativity, it would be a tonic for the exhausted nation, acting as a, quote, milestone between past and future to enrich and enliven the present. A diverse place of serious fun and light-hearted solemnity, reclaimed from the bomb rack and the decay of years. With fountains and carousels, boating ponds and acrobats, smooth sculptures, fantastic murals and sleek, futuristic buildings of curving steel, the austerity Brits donned their hats and gloves and strolled through the grounds in their Sunday best, unfurling their limbs and taking the sun after long years of war and all those anxious nights stifled by the blackout, getting accustomed once again to a bit of colour and pizzazz. The festival offered science and candy floss. It offered engineering with streamers and tea cakes. A thrilling peep at what Britain would look like now the war was over and the world beginning anew. Quote, whole walls of decoration are made of squares of coloured canvas pulled taut in geometric shapes and triangles to be lit with a variety of colours, wrote Cecil Beaton. A screen is made by hanging mirror-like coloured balls against the distant chimney pots of the city. Arches underneath the railway are painted strawberry pink or bright blue. The opening day, despite the rain, offered a reminder of Britain's old finery and grandeur, 
before the war had come to flatten it with bombs and shortages and despair. The royal family gathered at St Paul's Cathedral, that symbol of British resilience throughout the Blitz, for an afternoon of speeches and ceremony, whilst crowds waved and cheered at the rows of cloaks and feathers, white gloves and gold braid on the damp grey steps. It was Britain at its most splendid, and the newspapers loved the chance to write about such simple grandeur once again. Quote, At the stroke of noon, the pursuivants and heralds of the officers of arms and the Lord Mayor of London, bearing the city sword, led the king through the west door to the cathedral steps. The trumpeters of the household cavalry stationed on the steps sounded a fanfare. The waiting crowds cheered and the king began to tell the world that the festival of Britain was open. Behind the cathedral, on a miserable bomb site, youngsters had cleared a space in the jagged debris and weeds and built a huge bonfire, setting it alight to mark the king's visit. Other bonfires across the country were lit at the same time, creating optimistic blazes of light across the damp grey country. So the king announced it open and the festival threw wide its gates, with thousands flooding in each day to marvel at the shiny display of post-war Britain. The huge dome of discovery, with everything from Newton and Darwin to jet propulsion and nuclear physics, and also a twinkling recreation of the solar system, reached by an escalator which so charmed Winston Churchill that he kept going up and down the stairs. There was the new festival hall, the futuristic 300-foot sky lawn, exhibition of science, and displays of British artistic skills from fine China to Alice in Wonderland. Although local papers advertised cheap train fares to the capital so the readers might visit the heart of the festival, there were hundreds of local celebrations held across the country. York's Great Cathedral had special performances of choral and chamber music, and the city held a grand river carnival at a Georgian masked ball. Bournemouth hosted performances by the Young Vic and Sadler's Wells. There was a choir festival in Worcester, and a display of fine Scottish crafts and architecture in Edinburgh. And the huge festival ship, HMS Campania, which we spoke about in last week's podcast, painted a brilliant white and strung with bunting, called at the river cities of Plymouth, Glasgow, Newcastle, Bristol and Liverpool. And there were some rather more homely celebrations, such as the celebration, oh, I've used the word celebration there twice, I'll need to sort that out. There were some rather more homely celebrations, such as the celebration in Round Hay Park in Leeds, which featured donkeys and sandpits, or in Bridlington with its, quote, quite bewildering profusion of bowls tournaments and sand competitions. Coat Bridge had a performance by the band of the Scottish Gas Board, and Chichester held an ankle show. Alconcoats Park in Lancashire had a gala featuring sports events such as climbing the greasy pole, prize of one pound, tilting the bucket, prize of 15 shillings, and pillow fight, 10 and 15 shillings. And here we come to the Civil Defence score. I hope you see why I've taken this colourful roundabout route. If pillows and buckets were detracting somewhat from the splendour of the Festival of Britain, then consider the celebrations in Corby, Northamptonshire, who devoted one day of their festival programme to the unglamorous notion of preparing for nuclear war. The local Civil Defence Corps joined with the fire brigade on playing fields to demonstrate how they'd save us in war, but they had to tone down their plans when concerns were raised about potential damage to nearby flats if they began hosing water and tossing smoke bombs about. So instead they focused on a demonstration of their rescue skills where four local schoolboys went to the top of the flats and were then, quote, lowered by pulley from the top of the flats much to the excitement of dozens of onlooking children together with the local festival queen, Miss Rita Crawford. It may seem odd to combine the grime and labour of civil defence work with these festivities, but the Corps, from its formation in 1949 to its demise nearly 20 years later, 
was constantly engaged in recruitment campaigns, most of which had hints of adventure and dashes of national pride. Exactly the spirit being drummed up on London's South Bank. The Civil Defence Corps was a voluntary organisation which aimed to recruit and train hundreds of thousands of Brits so that they could save lives at home if war came, through a mixture of rescue work, first aid, ambulance squads, warden duties and welfare tasks. Civil Defence of a similar type had worked so well during the Blitz that it seemed natural to employ the same tactics in any new war. However, Prime Minister Clement Attlee was cynical. Even in the earliest days of the Cold War, he saw that we had entered a new world, telling the House of Commons on 19th of August 1945, we have been living through great events and we have got to realise we're living in a new world. We have seen in action a new force, the result of scientific discovery, the far-reaching consequences of which I think we find it difficult to grasp. A few days later, in a private address to ministers, he warned that using blitz-style civil defence against atomic attack would be futile waste. But in the absence of any alternative ideas, Britain passed the Civil Defence Act of 1948, which saw the formation of the Corps in the following year and required local authorities to form and train their own local divisions. Many councils, particularly those run by Labour, did not relish this new instruction from Whitehall, and the earliest and loudest dissent came from Coventry City Council, whose city was still scarred from its dreadful bombardment in the war. Operation Moonlight Sonata had targeted Coventry due to its motor industry, with the famous car makers of Jaguar, Daimler and Rover based there. Many car makers turned to aircraft engines during the war and the city became a huge centre for aircraft and munitions production. Consequently, the city was hammered by the Luftwaffe with over a thousand dead and firestorms devastating the city centre, including, of course, the city's 14th century cathedral. The Coventry and Warwickshire Hospital displayed their lighted red cross on its roof in a plea to the bombers for mercy, but the hospital, being close to an ordnance factory, suffered terribly. Dr Harry Winter, that night's resident surgical officer, climbed to the roof and said... I could hardly believe my eyes. All around the hospital grounds glowed literally hundreds of incendiary bombs, like lights twinkling on a mammoth Christmas tree. Some wards were so shattered that patients, too sick to be moved, lay in bed and watched the German bombers directly overhead. Patients were placed under their own beds and recalled Nurses and doctors flopping mattresses on top of them to shield them from flying debris. And one woman who was recovering from surgery said she was awoken by sirens in time to, quote, see the wall opposite my bed disappear. A doctor and nurse were lying on top of me to protect me from flying glass and debris. I was carried down a large curving staircase to my bed by soldiers. As they left me, a bomb screamed down and I screamed with it. One soldier ran back, folded me in his arms and rocked me. Other patients then joined me and all night the noise of screaming bombs was terrible. I saw an incendiary stuck in the wall just like a torch. At dawn came the all clear and it became eerily silent. Except for the crying of a baby, some said newly born. So that is a short extract from my chapter on the Civil Defence Corps. It still needs to be tidied up. Uh, reading it aloud like that, I can see that I've repeated the word uh, display twice and there's another word I repeated twice. I can't remember what it is now. It just shows the value of, of course, reading uh, your work aloud. So um, I hope you like that tiny little extract. And as I said at the beginning, I hope you'll forgive me and stay with me if I do skip the next few weeks. Um, in July I'll be able to, I hope, touch wood, breathe properly again. 
So um, before I go, let me thank Louis, my um, existing patron, who decided to increase his pledge. And as I say, when I woke up this morning, picked up my phone, I pick up my phone even before I turn around and say hello to Bomba or, or my husband David, pick up the phone, that's the first thing. And I saw that um, an email from Patreon saying that Louis had increased his pledge and I thought, I can't take June off. I can't go a whole four weeks with no podcast. Not when I've got such good people uh, donating money to the podcast each month. So you can thank Louis for this uh, little extract that we've just heard. And uh, of course, I thank Louis also. And I thank all of my patrons for supporting me. Remember, you can find me on Twitter at Julie A. McDevil, on Facebook under Nuclear Britain, or on my website at juliemcdevil.com. And I will be back soon, maybe not next Monday, but I will be back. Please do stay with me.